We're from Metro Kalo, and we're going to start talking. This is our inaugural Metro Kalo Tech Talk, uh, and we're going to try to address in the future some interesting audio-based uh, topics in a kind of a conversational manner. Um, so this is our first attempt at this, and it's going to be a little bit rough, but hopefully we'll get better with time. Yeah, uh, I think so, for sure. <laughs> yeah, great. Yeah, and um, we have been talking about some of these subjects what we like to talk about, and um, one of the thing um, we one of our first ideas is to bring up some lights about those binary aspect of audio, and um, yeah, and this was something that. Also, some customers asked me a couple of times, um, what is this about those 24-bit, 16-bit, 32-bit um, floating point, 60-bit floating point, and, and stuff like that. And um, there's some confusion there. And I was, maybe you can bring up some, some, some light into it. OK, so basically, there, there's this sort of long history of um, How many bits, what sample rate is appropriate for capturing audio that yeah. is uh, used for production and also used for delivery to, and to, to the folks who will be listening to the audio that you have in your final production? And you know, if we think back a little bit in time, up until sort of digital audio and CD audio became a the primary mechanism for distribution of audio, everything was analog. And analog has different sets of parameters that control, you know, its uh, overall quality level. Um, digital audio has different parameters that, and in many ways, sorry, I'm trying to figure out exactly how to couch this. Um, mm -hmm. In in many ways, digital audio has certain parameters that are better than analog sort of almost no matter how you set up the digital words and then it has other parameters that are worse than analog no matter how much how you set up the digital words so when people were originally looking at building delivery formats with digital audio they were trying to come up with a, a set of parameters that would make it so that the audio that came out from your digital playback system was better than you could reproduce in the the analog audio signal chains of the time, um, mm -hmm. and you know so there's some sort of generally well understood and and defined parameters for human hearing, right? I mean, you know the the sort of the standard 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz and yeah. about 120 dB of dynamic range is like the limit of the Actual, absolute softest sound to the loudest sound that a human being can perceive without damage and still uh, at the low end still be perceivable. So they sort of use those parameters to try to come up with a um, sorry uh, to come up with a uh, a sample rate and a bit depth that would allow you to encode that amount of audio information without any distortion or loss. Mm -hmm. Uh, and without having filtering on the the signals that would be perceivable by human beings. Now, the thing is that when CD audio came out, it was definitely the case that um, people were trying to also be as parsimonious with the amount of data that would be uh, stored and manipulated because digital signal processing and digital storage and digital transmission was expensive back then. Right? Uh, right. So, so the approach was let's let's get the absolute engineering minimum that will do the job. Ah, okay. okay. And so that's sort of where 16-bit 44-1 came out. Of course, the hard disk that was a really that was a kind of investment in these days. Yeah, right. right. So, 16-bit 44-1 was probably not the right choice. Yeah. Especially given how quickly and how quickly technology develops and how fast processing power, network speeds, and storage densities have increased in the mm -hmm. in the years that have followed, it was probably a somewhat short-sighted choice. 
And obviously, on the production side, you're not, we haven't been sort of tied to that choice over time. And that's why we've seen sort of the ongoing increase in sample rates and in bit depths. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. So, so 44116 is like too low, right? That's mm -hmm. sort of at the, that's a limit that's low enough that you can't fully represent everything that you're capturing and mixing and hearing in the studio. Mm -hmm. So now if you look in the other direction, what, what are the benefits and drawbacks of going to say higher bit depths and higher sample rates? Mm -hmm. So with each, as you increase the sample rate, you increase the amount of processing power, storage, and time required to transmit and process and store the material, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. Um, with, with increasing bit depths, the, you're not really, it's much more of a quantized thing. You know, when you go from like say 16 bits to 24 bits to 32 bits, you're not really increasing the amount of processing power required to process that just because of the way that machines are organized. Yeah. If you go from, say, 32 bits to 64 bits or from 24 bits to 48 bits, that generally increases the amount of processing power that is required to do the processing. Yeah. Or the cost. You know, it may not, it might not increase the amount of processing power required, but it might uh, increase the cost of the processors that will do the processing in the same amount of time. Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. So it's a much more discrete transition in terms of bit depth as yeah. opposed to sample rates where it's really kind of a linear of scaling, right? I mean, if you're using 48 hertz, kilohertz as a sample rate versus 96 kilohertz, mm -hmm. then at 96 kilohertz, everything takes twice as much processing power, it takes twice as much space, and it'll take twice as, much, twice as long to transmit it. Yeah, right, yeah. Okay, so, um, you know, analog is nominally like infinite bandwidth and infinite resolution, right? Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that's the ultimate goal is to make everything infinite. And, you know, mm -hmm. that's sort of the marketing speak in terms of, of digital audio as well. It's like, oh, well, you know, if 96K is good, then 192K is better, and 384K is even better than that, and DSD, which is one point something megahertz is even better than that. Mm -hmm. And the question is, you know, does that really hold up in terms of the details of actually getting the signal processing done? And where are the, the real limitations in the system as opposed to sort of the marketing speak bit yeah. number yeah. points, That's right? Mm -hmm. So the thing is that if you look at if you look at analog audio, like I said, I mean, the, the limitation of human hearing is about 120 dB range, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right? And, you know, even if you give yourself some headroom and footroom below and above the range of hearing, then that maybe gets you to, like, 132 dB or so, mm -hmm. maybe mm -hmm. 144 dB. Mm -hmm. So 144 dB is 24 bits. Mm -hmm. You get effectively 6 dB of dynamic, dynamic range for every bit. Oh, yeah, yeah. Right? So with 24 bits, you have about 144 dB of dynamic range. Well, it's a lot, yeah. And, you know, that's giving you a solid 24 dB of headroom above what human being, the entire range that human beings can perceive. So does it really make sense to have, like, sort of delivery formats that are greater than 24 bits? Mm -hmm. Probably not. Mm -hmm. Especially since the other thing is that you can't actually build an analog device that has 144 dB of dynamic range, right. Yeah. right? I mean, the noise floor of any analog device is, you know, the best ones are like 120, 123, yeah. maybe 126 dB below. That's their, a perfect, nearly perfect unit, <laughs> yeah. That's a nearly perfect unit, yeah. you know, and, and, that, and that's relatively esoteric, right? I mean, to get those kinds of noise performance, you might need to, like, cryogenically chill the device. Mm -hmm. Or you might need to run with uh, voltage rails that are well beyond what you can use in a normal, uh, useful circumstances, and certainly more yeah. higher than what's going to be in a, a consumer's home or even in a, a normal studio. Yeah, exactly, depending on the power supplies that you've got, and suddenly aspects like that are much more important than anything else. Yeah, right. Yeah. Right. So, so the thing is that basically for a delivery format, 24-bit is perfect. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's perfect in the sense that it fully exceeds the range of anything that comes before or after it. Mm. 
So there's, you know, there's no, there's no loss of information that's perceivable, either on what was coming in, relative to what was coming in, or relative to what was, what's going out. Mm -hmm. So, 24-bit is great for for the the delivery format. Um, sample rates are a little bit different, in the sense that, you know, theoretically, like 24 kilohertz as a sample rate. Maybe I'm sorry, not 24 kilohertz. 48 kilohertz as a sample rate. Maybe yeah. 50 or 60 kilohertz as a sample rate yeah. should nominally be perfect, because the mm -hmm. thing is that you know, like the best human hearing mm -hmm. goes up to maybe 22 kilohertz, maybe 24 mm -hmm. kilohertz, mm -hmm. and and that's kind of a stretch. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. So the thing is that with enough bits and enough uh, and a particular sample rate you can accurately represent the waveform up to half of the sample rate. Mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. With essentially infinite precision. I mean, the, mm -hmm. the precision is only limited by the number of bits that you have in the words. And, you know, the, this whole concept of, well, the signal is stair-stepped or the signal doesn't have um, an accurate representation of phase at the higher rates is not true. You know, you can mathematically prove that that's not the case with a with a converter system that has proper anti-aliasing and proper anti-imaging filters, and has enough resolution in the words, coupled with enough sample rate. Now the thing is that what you do lose is at the very highest end of the spectrum, you'll lose the ability to do phase discrimination amongst mm -hmm. the sine waves mm -hmm. um, yeah. when you're getting very very close to the Nyquist frequency. Um, so the point of that is that basically what that means is that you do want a buffer zone between where the Nyquist frequency of your sampling system is and where the highest frequency of interest of the, the perception ability of the either the, the capture side or the reproduci reproduction side is mm -hmm. capable of doing. Now, the, the problem with 44.1 is that it's too close to where yeah. people can actually hear things. So even though the distortions are happening at the edge of the perception range, that they still can interact with the perception range. So that's why maybe 60 kilohertz ought to be perfect. Now, mm -hmm. that's also in a perfect world where everything works exactly as defined by theory. Yeah. Right? So when you actually go and build one of these systems, you know, people have their perceptions of how they perform and you know, the general perception I would say amongst engineers that I respect is that 96K definitely sounds better than 48 or 44.1. Yeah. And then there are a lot of engineers who will say that 192K sounds better than 96K. Reminds me into one of those recordings, we at least. Wasn't it last year where someone got an um, award for, for one of those recordings? Was by a Hi-Fi magazine. Was done in 192K, a, a Jack with a Jacklin disc. Uh huh. Was also on the Mio list. Yeah. And um, yeah, and I heard this recording. It was impressive. Absolutely, and it was a stereo recording. I remembered it. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, but going on. <laughs> so, so, so the thing is that basically, when you're starting to talk about the differences that that are achieved between 96K and 192K. These start to filter into, well, they might have an impact on the overall signal processing. It might have an impact on the specific implementation of the chips and, you know, that the chip might perform in a way that uh, is less distortion or where the distortion or the noise is shaped in such a way because you have the higher bandwidth of the actual processing of the samples. But in, in, in terms of the actual information that's conveyed in the bitstream, there really shouldn't be a difference at the point of human perception. Yeah, right. Okay. So, so you know, going much beyond 192K, to me, doesn't really make that much sense. Um, and certainly based on the feedback that we've gotten from people in terms of how, you know, they feel our devices perform at those higher sample rates, I feel like there's sort of a... It, we're talking about something that's at best a diminishing return and at worst maybe is actually going to be a, a, a negative change where you're now actually capturing noise that can then intermodulate through other comp 
you know, other components and, and turn into something that is a net negative in yeah. the overall recording process. Yeah, when, when you think about that most of the power switch um, units have work in a range of 100 to 150 kilohertz or something like that, the right. bad ones are 200 kilohertz, but suddenly you're in this range. That's true, yeah, interesting aspect, yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I've seen some recordings that have been done live with uh, at 192k, and mm. you, know, you run them through Spectrafu, and it's pretty interesting. I mean, you have you have audio say up to about mm, maybe 30 kilohertz or so. I mean, where you can actually. I mean, I, I was actually watching this live, so I was listening in the room and watching Spectrafu on the converters, yeah. and yeah. so. You know the the audio spectrum is changing and following the music up to around 30 kilohertz, and then from 30 kilohertz on up to you know 96 kilohertz, it, it pretty much had a, a constant noise floor yeah. that was not flat, and in particular, in some of the upper frequencies was like you know minus 20 dB or minus 30 dB fs. I mean, very high level constant noise floor. And wow. what we found that the noise floor was being generated by was the lighting system. Of course, yeah, yeah. Aspen so the thing is that all of that, all of that, that electrical noise that was captured into the system. Wow. You know, okay. Can you hear it? No. It does it enhance the recording? No. But it does have the potential, depending on what gear is downstream from the converters, of getting intermodulated back into the audible range. At which point, maybe it makes it worse, not better. Yeah, interesting. Yeah, of course, if you have a kind of noise with that kind of energy, it's a lot. Yes. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's something, especially electric, electricity, electrical noise is something like white noise. It's potentially very high energy. Yes. And, well, in this case, you know, it's toned because it's like the dimmer switches, ah, right? Oh, yeah. So okay. It's not. It's actually switching, switching on and off. It's not just yeah. white noise. It has some peaked structure. Right. Okay. And uh, so you know the the in a, if it were to intermodulate, it would intermodulate as tone. All right. Okay. What what is mm, one aspect of this sampling rate thing? Um, what is it about the time domain when you have signals? When you have, for example, huge impulses with very going straight up, and isn't it better if you have more samples per second or per millisecond? Right. Because so, it's transients. So, so the like thing that. is that transients. You know, if you have a like the equivalent of a step function, right, where the yeah. signal goes along and then instantaneously changes and then goes along. Yeah. That that, sure that, yeah. that type of function requires an infinite bandwidth to represent. Yeah. Yeah. Right? I now, think that's that's where the idea is coming from. Yeah. Right. So the thing is. If you take that step function in analog mm -hmm. and play it through a speaker, right? What's going to happen to it? Yeah, you got a slow slew rate, of course. It's not that fast as the original impulse, and you have this pulse ringing. <laughs> right. So yeah. the thing is that basically what happens is that the speaker system will da will band limit the signal. That's right. Yeah. Okay. okay. You send that pulse into your ear. What's your ear going to do to it? Ah, right, it's the same thing. You send yeah. the pulse into a microphone. What's the microphone going to do to it? Yeah, right. Okay. Right? Yeah. So, so the thing is that the the physical world is band limited. We don't things don't change infinitely fast in the in the physical world. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So the overall, you know, the transducers in the physical world, which are the microphones, your ears, speakers, headphones, all those things. They all have their own filter functions associated with them, and you know anything that you put into it that exceeds its filter function is going to get filtered out. Okay. Mm -hmm. So the idea is that you know basically what you want to do is make it so that your digital recording system has just a bit more bandwidth than all of the other filtering elements in the system. Okay, so you never tr go into the edge of the this aspect of the of the system, so that you have still left some air in terms of time and bandwidth. Okay, interesting. Right. So I mean, the thing is that we never want we never want the converters to be the thing that are limiting the slew rate of the system. We never want the converters to be the thing that is the the limiting bandwidth of the system. 
But overall, something's going to limit the bandwidth of the system because it's a physically realized system. All right. Okay. And and so then any resources that you're applying to uh, capturing or storing the data where you're capturing more data than can possibly be physically realized in the system. And, and again, this is not like possibly in the sense of, well, our technology today doesn't let us do it. It's possibly in the sense of, you know, the ear brain system simply cannot perceive beyond yeah. a certain limit, right? Okay. Um, so yeah. any, anything that you're doing beyond that limit is essentially you're just wasting resources. Now, mm -hmm. the thing is that usually what you find is that the waste of resources is such that, you know, wasting a little bit doesn't cost you any more than, than not wasting a little bit. So you build in, you know, a margin of error, right? Which is why, for example, 96K probably really is a, a good target and 192K like I said, may have some benefits that, that are harder to sort of prove mathematically why they would be the case, but, you know, nothing's perfect. But then you start going past there, and now you're just doubling and doubling and doubling for not necessarily any benefit. And yeah, course, yeah. you're allowing signals in that could potentially, depending on other nonlinearities in the system, actually corrupt the signal that you can perceive. Oh, okay, okay. Now, there's one place where the sample rate actually potentially is really important and goes much beyond what your ear brain system can handle. And that's for signal processing. Okay. So, for example, if you're doing um, nonlinear signal processing, which is mm -hmm. things like guitar amp models, mm -hmm. uh, distortion effects, Anything where you're basically going to be changing the shape of the signal in a way that's not reversible. Mm hmm. Okay. What that does is every time you make one of those nonlinear changes, it mm -hmm. adds harmonics to the signal. Yeah, and it can go up higher and higher and higher. And they yeah. go up higher and higher and higher. And now the thing yeah. about when you do that in the analog domain, it's not a problem, right? Because yeah. If you say have a signal that has most of its energy around 440 hertz, you know, concert mm -hmm. A, right? Mm -hmm. And you um, have some very high nonlinear distortion that adds a hundred harmonics mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. to the signal, right? Each harmonic is a is the the you take the base frequency of the signal and you multiply it. So if you had a hundred harmonics of of uh, 440 hertz, that would be uh, what? 4 kilohertz, 44 kilohertz, 440 kilohertz, 44 yeah. kilohertz. I, should, I shouldn't try to do math in my head. <laughs> um, yeah, no, it would, be, uh, it would be 44 kilohertz, right? Okay. So you take 44 kilohertz in an analog system, and you run it through the analog filter function of the speaker and your ears, and anything that's up, say, above 24 kilohertz or so, you can't perceive. It just kind of gets filtered out. And that's fine. You yeah. know, you hear you hear the the distortion effects in band. The you know the first harmonic, the second harmonic, all the way up to around twenty kilohertz, maybe a little bit more, maybe a little bit less, depending on how good your ears are. Mm -hmm. Now let's do that in the digital domain. The problem with the digital domain is that in the digital domain, you can represent each and every frequency up to the Nyquist frequency of the system, which is half the sample rate. Yeah. Essentially perfectly. And then as soon as you go past the Nyquist frequency, you yeah, can't exactly. represent it properly at all. Yeah. It's what's, it's what's called an illegal signal. Okay, okay. So n now what happens when you have a signal that mm -hmm. is above the Nyquist frequency? You get something called aliasing. Okay, all right. Now let's see, can we figure out a really quick description of aliasing. The, the canonical description of temporal aliasing is um, that, you know, almost everyone has, has seen is if you remember sort of like the old cowboy movies, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. they'd have a camera that would be like shooting a, a wagon rolling down the street. Ah, yeah, where you can see those 
Cars are turning. Okay. Mm -hmm. And the spokes turn backwards. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So the wagon's going, the wagon's going this way. So the wheels are going that way. But yeah. in the movie, it looks like they're going backwards. Yeah. Yeah. And and the reason for that is that basically the wheels are turning around faster than the Nyquist frequency of the 24 frames per second or 30 frames per second that the movie was shot at. Okay. Okay. So what happens is, if you imagine that here's the two spokes of the wheels, right? Mm -hmm. And when the wheels are moving slowly, they go like this for each of the frames of the movie. Yeah. Right? And then when you put the frames in order, it looks like they're animating. Now, if you imagine that they've turned so much by the time that the next frame comes along that it's yeah. like this... Interesting. Then okay. what happens is that, you know, this was where this one looked like it was in the beginning, and now yeah. it looks like it's here. So yeah. it actually looks like it's going backwards. Okay. okay. And the reason that it looks like it's going backwards is because it's aliased. Essentially, mm -hmm. it, you know, you're, you've changed so much that it looks like you've gone in the opposite direction. Okay. And the same happens with the samples in the audio domain. Right. So the thing is that, like, for example, if you have a sample rate that's at uh, 48 kilohertz, yeah. and then you have a tone that's at 23 kilohertz, it will have a certain waveform in the sampled space. If you take a tone that's at 25 kilohertz, it will actually have the same waveform as the one at 23 kilohertz. Yeah, yeah. Because you're basically skipping over entire portions of the wave and resampling you're picking up essentially the sort of the lower harmonic of it all. And so if what happens is that you start out with a, a signal that's actually properly conditioned for uh, for digital audio, mm -hmm. you know, it's below the Nyquist frequency of the sampling system, mm -hmm. and then mm -hmm. you do things that add harmonics to it, for example, by distorting it. Yeah. If any of the added harmonics are above the Nyquist frequency of the sampling system, then they will get aliased back into the audible range in an right. harmonic okay. way. And then they sound really bad. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. And this is something what everybody can experience when, for example, when you're using a, a guitar simulation um, or something, play this on 88 or 96K, it immediately sounds so much better. Right. And I also realize with soft sense, with soft synthesizers, it's the same thing. Yes. And, and I don't like to think about what happens with equalizing or compression. Well, compression especially, equalizing has the benefit of its being, it's a linear process. Yeah, so compression is not. Compression is not. Yeah, definitely Equalization, not. in principle, can be done without having the higher sample rate. However, what happens is that you find that the shapes of the uh, equalization curve get distorted near the Nyquist frequency. Yeah, okay. Mm -hmm. So even though the, the sound isn't distorted, the way that the equalization is done has a different shape than you would expect if it was being done in the analog domain. And that can have an impact on sound quality. Mm -hmm. So, basically what we find is that, um, and, and remember, the other thing that I was saying is that the 24 bits for delivery formats is perfect. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You sort of have a similar issue in terms of, you know, the, the basic idea of a high-pass filter is, you know, you have sample, this sample here, and this sample here, and you know, it's more complicated than this, but basically you subtract them from each other. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right? If the samples are very close to each other, then they're going to cancel out. Yeah, okay. It's hard to if distinguish. If the samples are very different from each other, they'll get boosted. Yeah. Right? Okay. okay. And as a result, what happens is that the low frequency energy is reduced and the high frequency energy is increased. Wow. Now, real filters are more complicated than that, but they're based on that concept of basically taking... Uh, that for part of the, that you're going to take the samples and subtract them and add them with different time delays and, and that mm -hmm. sort of thing. And what you find is that for a lot of filter structures, you'll have things where you'll take two samples that are supposedly close in value and you'll subtract them from each other and then multiply them by some large number. Okay. And what happens is that when you subtract, if you take two real numbers, you know, numbers in the real world, analog numbers, mm -hmm. and you mm -hmm. subtract them from each other, then you get another real number with infinite precision. Mm -hmm. If you take a uh, 
a number in the digital domain and subtract two numbers that are have a lot of precision, say 24 bits of precision, right? Mm -hmm. But they only differ by each other, from each other by a little bit. Mm -hmm. Then the amount of precision that's left after you've done the subtraction is only the little bit, right? So you might have 24 bits of precision in both numbers, but the difference, the precision of the difference of them might only be two or three bits. Okay. So what happens under those circumstances is that you introduce quantization noise because you've lost precision. And as a, as a result, you have the situation where making, choosing to use larger precision numbers for the internal computations relative to the uh, numbers that were sampled or the numbers that will be delivered gives you benefits, again, in terms of being able to manage noise and distortion and other sorts of artifacts that are purely internal to the calculation. Okay. okay. So, what what the point of this all is is that capture has one set of requirements, delivery has a similar set of requirements, but internal mm -hmm. processing actually can benefit in ways that are measurable and definable from both higher sample rates and also higher precision. This this leads me to another aspect. That means at least when whenever I have a like to have a digital signal. Whatever it is, if it's just capturing or processing or something, the the whole the whole working process has a huge benefit if it's as, as clean as possible. Absolutely. Well, the thing, the thing is that nonlinearities tend to chain too, right? So the yeah, thing is yeah. that if you have distortion somewhere in the system, yeah, and then you have more distortion somewhere else in the system, the distortion will distort the distortion. Yeah, and then you have a multiplier. <laughs> exactly, and then, then you get intermodulation, and you get much higher harmonics that could alias back, and you have all these things where, you know, you thought you were recording something that was concert A, but, you know, in fact, you were recording something that was concert A plus some noise up at, at uh, 20 kilohertz, and then when you run it through your distortion processor that isn't properly an anti-alias, you know, you get nice distortion on your concert A, and then you get this weird tone that's moving around, that has to do with the noise that was up around 20 kilohertz. Or even worse, you have the noise that was up around, you know, 40 kilohertz or around uh, 80 kilohertz because you're using a high sampled system that was completely inaudible, you didn't even hear it in the room, couldn't tell about it, and now because of some sort of nonlinear processing, it got anti, it got aliased back into the audible range and this phantom tone just showed up. Wow. Yeah, and it took effect on, oh my god, it's coming in through the back door. This is interesting, because this is something what I also realized when, when doing some recording is um, you have to be really careful about those, where I said, sound shaping box, mostly of them using transformers, tubes, and stuff like that, and suddenly you have, in the beginning you mean, okay, wow, this is a big sound, and then you start doing tracking with those stuff and make another one, another one, and another one. And what you're adding is adding all those problems that you described. Awesome. And this is a very, very good description about that aspect. Never heard this before. <laughs>